Hi everyone, this is Glenda Ganzon and welcome to my Human Anatomy and Physiology class. And for today's video, I'm going to be discussing the structure and the basic functions of the nervous system. So stay tuned. Kick. The nervous system includes the brain, the nervous tissue contained within the cranium and the spinal cord, and the extension of nervous tissue within the vertebral column. That suggests it is made of two organs and you may not even think of the spinal cord as an organ, but the nervous system is a very complex structure. Within the brain, many different and separate regions are responsible for many different and separate functions. It is as if the nervous system is composed of many organs that all look similar and can only be differentiated using tools such as microscope or electrophysiology. In comparison, it is easy to see that the stomach is different than the esophagus or the liver, so you can imagine the digestive system as a collection of, a collection of specific organs. The nervous system can be divided into two major regions, the central and peripheral nervous systems. The central nervous system, or CNS, is the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, or PNS, is everything else. The brain is contained within the cranial cavity of the skull, and the spinal cord is contained within the vertebral cavity of the vertebral column. It is a bit of an oversimplification to say that the CNS is what is inside these two cavities and the peripheral nervous system is outside of them. But that is one way to start to think about it. In actuality, there are some elements of the peripheral nervous system that are within the cranial or vertebral cavities. The peripheral nervous system is so named because it is on the periphery, meaning beyond the brain and spinal cord. Depending on the different aspects of the nervous system, the dividing line between central and peripheral is not necessarily universal. So, nervous tissue present in both the CNS and PNS contains the two basic type of or two ba basic types of cells the neurons and the glial cells. The glial cell is one of the variety of cells that provide framework of tissue that supports the neurons and their activities. The neuron is the more functionally important of the two in terms of the communicative function of the nervous system. And in order to describe the functional division of the nervous system, it is important to understand the structure of a neuron. So, neurons are cells and therefore have a soma, or what we call as the cell body. But they also have extensions of the cell, and each extension is generally referred to as a process. So, there is one important process that every neuron has called an axon, which is the fiber that connects a neuron with its target. Another type of process that branches off the soma is the dendrite. The dendrites are responsible for receiving most of the input from other neurons. Looking at the nervous tissue, there are regions that predominantly contain cell bodies and regions that are largely composed of just axons. And these two regions within the nervous system structures are often referred to as gray matter or the regions with many cell bodies and dendrites or white matter the regions with many axons this picture shows the appearance of these regions in the brain and spinal cord the colors ascribed to this region are what would be seen in fresh or unstained nervous tissue gray matter is not necessarily gray but it can be pinkish because of blood content or even slightly tan depending on how long the tissue has been preserved but white matter is white because axons are insulated by lipid rich substance called myelin so lipids can appear as white or fatty material much like the or the fat on a raw piece of chicken or beef actually gray matter may have that color ascribed to it because 
next to the white matter is just darker, hence gray. The distinction between the gray matter and white matter is most often applied to central nervous system, which has large regions that can be seen with the unaided eye. So when looking at the peripheral structures, often a microscope is used and the tissue is stained with artificial colors. That is not to say that central nervous system cannot be stained and viewed under, the, uh, under a microscope, but uh, unstained tissue is most likely from the central nervous system. For example, a frontal section of the brain or a cross section of the spinal cord. So regardless of the appearance of stained or unstained tissue, the cell bodies of neurons or axons can be located in discrete anatomical structure that need to be named. Those names are specific to whether the structure is central or peripheral. A localized collection of neuron cell bodies in the central nervous system is referred to as a nucleus. In the peripheral nervous system, a cluster of neuron cell bodies is referred to as ganglion. This picture indicates how the term nucleus has a few meanings with anatomy and physiology. It is the center of an atom where protons and neutrons are found. It is the center of the cell where the DNA is found. And it is a center of some function of the CNS. There is also a potentially confusing use of the word ganglion. The, pl the, the plural form of this ganglion is ganglia. That has a historical explanation. In the central nervous system, there is a group of nuclei that are connected together and were once called the basal ganglia before ganglion became accepted as a description for the peripheral structure. And some sources refer to this group of nuclei as the basal nuclei to avoid confusion. Terminology applied to bundles of axons also differs depending on location. A bundle of axons or fibers found in the CNS is called a tract, whereas the same thing in the PNS would be called a nerve. There is an important point to make about these terms, which is that they can both be used to refer to the, the same bundle of axons. So when those axons are in the PNS, the term is nerve, but if they are in CNS, the term is tract. The most obvious example of this is the axons that project from the retina into the brain. And those axons are, are called the optic nerve as they leave the eye, but when they are inside the cranium, they are referred to as the, the optic tract. There is a specific place where the name changes, which is the optic chiasm, but they are still the same axons. A similar situation outside of science can be described for some roads. Imagine a road called Broad Street. In a town called uh, Anyville, the road leaves Anyville and goes to the next town over called Hometown. So when the road cro uh, crosses the line between the two towns and is in Hometown, its name changes to Main Street. That is uh, the idea behind the naming of the retinal axons. In the peripheral nervous system, they are called the optic nerve and in the CNS they are the optic tract. The nervous system can also be divided on a basis of its function but anatomical division and functional division are different. So the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system both contribute to the same function but those functions can be attributed to different regions of the brain such as the cerebral cortex or the hypothalamus or to different ganglia in the periphery. So the problem with trying to fit functional differences into anatomical division is that sometimes the same structure can be part of several functions. For example, the optic nerve carries signals from the retina that are either used for the conscious perception of visual stimuli, which takes place in the cerebral cortex, or for the flexive responses of smooth muscle tissue that are processed through the hypothalamus. 
There are two ways to consider how the nervous system is divided functionally. First, the basic functions of the nervous system are sensation, integration, and response. Secondly, control of the body can be somatic or autonomic. Divisions that are largely defined by the structures are involved in the response. So, there is also a region of peripheral nervous system that is called the enteric nervous system that is responsible for a specific set of functions within the realm of autonomic control related to gastrointestinal function. The nervous system is involved in receiving information about the environment around us or that is what we call as the sensation and generating responses to that information and we call that as motor responses. The nervous system can also be divided into regions that are responsible for sensation, sensory functions, and for the response that is the motor functions. But there is a third function that needs to be included. So let's take note of that. Sensory input needs to be integrated with other sensations as well as memories, emotional state, or learning, or what we call as the cognition. Some regions of the nervous system are termed integration or association areas. And the process of integration combines sensory, sensory perception and higher cognitive functions such as memories, learning, and emotion to produce a response. So the first major function of nervous system is sensation. Receiving information about the environment to gain input about what is happening outside the body or sometimes within the body. The sensory function of the nervous system register the presence of a change from homeostasis or a particular event in the environment known as stimulus. The senses we think of most are the big five, taste, smell, touch, sight, and hearing. The stimuli for taste and smell are both chemical substances, which are the molecules, compounds, ions, etc. Touch is physical or mechanical stimuli that interact with the skin. Sight is light stimuli and hearing is the perception of sound, which is a physical stimulus similar to the or similar to some aspects of touch. There are also actually some more senses than just those, but the least uh, represents the major senses. And those five are all senses that receive stimuli from the outside world and of which there is conscious perception. Additional sensory stimuli might be from the internal environment or inside the body, such as the stretch of an organ wall or the concentration of certain ions in the blood. Also, the nervous system produces a response on a basis of the stimuli perceived by sensory structures. An obvious response would be the movement of muscles such as withdrawing a hand from a hot stove, but there are broader uses of the term. The nervous system can cause the contraction of the three types of muscle tissue. For example, skeletal muscle contracts to move the skeleton. Cardiac muscle is influenced as heart rate increases during the exercise and smooth muscle contracts as the digestive system moves food along the digestive tract. So responses also include the neural control of the glands in the body as well as uh, such as the production and secretion of sweat by the eccrine and merocrine sweat glands found in the skin to lower the body temperature. So responses can be divided into those that are voluntary or conscious like contraction and or contraction of skeletal muscle and those that are involuntary which are contraction of stomach muscles, regulation of cardiac muscle, activation of glands, and so on. So voluntary responses are governed by the somatic nervous system and involuntary responses are governed by the autonomic nervous system which 
Stimuli that are received by sensory structures are communicated to the nervous system where that information is processed. So this is called integration. Stimuli are compared with or integrated with other stimuli, memories of previous stimuli, or the state of a person at a particular time. And this leads to the specific response that will be generated. Seeing a baseball pitch to a batter will not automatically cause the batter to swing. The trajectory of the ball and its speed will need to be considered. Maybe the count of three, ball and one strike, and the batter wants to let this pitch go by in the hope of getting a walk to the first base. Or maybe the batter's team is so far ahead it would be a fun to just swing away. The nervous system can be divided into two parts, mostly the basis of functional difference in responses. The somatic nervous system or SNS is responsible for conscious perception and voluntary motor or motor responses. So voluntary motor response means the construct or the contraction of skeletal muscle but those contractions are not always voluntary in the sense that you have to want to perform them. Some somatic motor responses are reflexes and often happen without a conscious decision to perform them. So if your friend jumps out behind a corner and yells, you will be startled and you might scream or leap back. So you did decide to do that and you may not have wanted to give your friend a reason to laugh at your expense but it is a reflex involving skeletal muscle contractions. Other motor responses become automatic, in other words, unconscious. As a person learns motor skills referred to as the habit learning or procedural memory. And the Autonomic Nervous System, or ANS, is responsible for involuntary control of the body, usually for the sake of homeostasis, regulation of internal movement. So sensory input for autonomic function can be from sensory structures tuned to external or internal environmental stimuli. The motor output extends to smooth and cardiac muscle as well as glandular tissue and the role of the autonomic system is to regulate the organ system of the body which usually means to control homeostasis so sweat glands for example are controlled by the autonomic system and when you're hot sweating helps cool your body down that is a a homeostatic mechanism but when you are nervous you might start sweating also and that is not homeostatic it is the physiological response to an emotional state there is another division of the nervous system that describes functional responses this is the enteric nervous system or ENS which is responsible for controlling the smooth muscle and glandular tissue in your digestive system. It is a large part of the PNS and is not dependent on the CNS. It is sometimes valid however uh, to consider the enteric system to be a part of the autonomic system because the neural structures that make up the enteric system are component of the autonomic output that regulates digestion. So this ends my discussion about the function and structure of nervous system. If you have any question, please write it in the comment section down below and I'll be glad to answer them all. And if you're still not subscribed to my channel, please do also consider subscribing. Hit the notification button so that you'll be updated with my new videos and if you like this video please give it a thumbs up and share so once again i would like to thank you all for watching this video and for listening to my discussion until my next video bye everyone